the previous videos of this unit, we discussed the notion of topologically ordered states. We said that they are characterized by having a set of fractionalized quasi-particles. In the fractional quantum Hall effect, for example, what's fractionalized above all is the charge. In other cases, it would be different fractional quantum numbers. They come together with the fractional statistics associated with the interchange of those quasi-particles. And that comes together with a ground state degeneracy when you put the system on a toes. Now we went even further and talked about non-abelian states, which are in some sense the most interesting corner of that uh, subject. Uh, and what we said was that in a non-abelian state, even on a plane, where you put, when you put quasi-particles into the state, the ground state will become degenerate. And there will be a degeneracy that is, that is exponential in the number of quasi-particles. Now let's do a, a little bit on, on, on these uh, notions. So what do we mean when we say that the ground state is degenerate? We mean here's the spectrum of the system. This is the system. Uh, the system has some quasi-particles in its ground state. So imagine, for example, uh, it may be a, a fractional quantum Hall state, where by putting uh, small gates at some points in the sample, I make it worthwhile energetically to the system to accommodate some quasi-particles into the ground state. So now I have quasi-particles in the, in the ground state, and there's a degeneracy of the ground state. There are many ground states. They are separated by an energy gap from a continuum of excitations. Now, this the degeneracy is topological. What do we mean by that? If I write the Hamiltonian and diagonalize it, imagine that I know how to diagonalize it, I'm going to have a subspace of ground states whose energies are all identical up to uh, an exponentially small correction in the, in the size of the system. And I call this energy zero. Then I have a diagonal of uh, uh, excited states all gapped from the ground states and pretty much a continuum. Uh, and, and, and that's it, it's diagonalized. If I now come with a perturbation, change the Hamiltonian a little bit, what's going to happen, and this is the topological protection, there will be no matrix elements introduced between the ground states. There will be matrix elements introduced between the ground state and the excited states here and here. And there will be lots of changes here. But when I re-diagonalize the system, because of the energy gap, the changes in the energies here will be minute, will be exponentially small. The wave functions may change a lot, but the, uh, the spectral degeneracy will be kept. So uh, that's a, a topologically protected ground state degeneracy. Now we can uh, uh, formulate it, uh, formalize it a little bit by thinking about those wave functions, the wave functions of the degenerate ground states. We focus now on uh, the degenerate ground states uh, subspace. So each of the wave functions has the coordinates of the electrons, uh, let's say if it's a quantum Hall state, of the electrons uh, as variables, and has the positions of the quasi-particles as parameters. There will be many such ground states, exponentially small, uh, large number in the number of uh, quasi-particles, k in this uh, uh, notation here, each one of the uh, ground states will have this set of, uh, same set of parameters, but they will have different wave functions. Now, if I carry out a change, an adiabatic change in the Hamiltonian, for example, by interchanging two of those positions, taking this to here and that to here, if I do it adiabatically, the system will stay in the ground state. But uh, there are many ground states, so it will stay in the ground state subspace, which means I'm not guaranteed to just multiply the ground state by a phase factor. I'm guaranteed by the adiabatic theorem that I will multiply the state by a unitary transformation that keeps me within the ground state subspace. Now, this unitary transformation, it turns out, is topological, meaning up to a global phase, which I don't care about, it's determined only by the topology of the trajectories. If I do the interchange inter this way or this way, 
that won't make any difference. What matters is only the topology. If I send one quasi-particle to encircle a third or a fourth quasi-particle, that will change the final uh, outcome. So the unit transform unitary transformation is determined only by this braiding diagram of the uh, quasi-particles. Now this is as robust as you can expect. Uh, an electronic condensed matter system full of details, full, full of, of impurities to ever get. So that raises this uh, uh, beautiful idea of making use of this topological robustness uh, for a field that really needs some robustness. And this is the field of quantum computation. And that's the idea of topological quantum computation. So the idea is that we have a subspace of the generate ground states which we will use as our computational subspace. And we know how to carry out unitary transformations in that subspace, and those unitary transformations are protected from errors by this topological uh, nature of the, of the transformations. And they are protected from uh, decoherence, from the effects of the environment, because the environment cannot measure which of the ground states we are at, because no local operation can measure the ground state. So that's the idea. It's a very beautiful idea, but do we have examples for non-abelian states in nature? Well, we discussed so far several non-abelian setups in this course. We talked about Majorana zero modes in topological superconductors. Yuval carried many of those in his uh, uh, chapter. We talked about Kitaev's uh, honeycomb model in, in this unit of the course. And we talked about uh, non-abelian quantum world states in particular, the new equals five halves a uh, non-abelian state, the Fafian, anti-Fafian, particle all Fafian, uh, 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 the uh, Fafian is the Murid state, other states were, uh, uh, other Fafian quantum world states which were non-abelian were proposed by uh, Reed and Rezai. So we talked about those. We have a list, but it's not a very long list. It would have been nice to have a longer list of non-abelian states. And what I'm going to discuss now is an approach that uh, uh, allows us to engineer non-abelian uh, uh, quantum whole state or, or non-abelian state by combining together fractional quantum whole effect and superconductivity. Let's see how this happens. So let's remind ourselves of the essential aspects of the fractional quantum whole effect that we're going to need uh, in this discussion. Of course, we have an entire subject, an entire chapter on the subject. Well, what we need to remember is that the fractional quantum whole state is, uh, has a bulk energy gap has chiral gapless modes at the edge, and has fractional, uh, fractionally charged quasi-particles. Uh, using those, we'd like uh, to introduce a new type of a non-abelian state. You know, in general, non-abelian states are an offer made to the electrons. Um, the electrons can form a non-abelian state at some energy cost, but they have other offers. They can form a billion quantum whole states take, for example, nucleus five halves. They can form a, a billion quantum whole states of nucleus five halves. They can form Fermi liquid of composite fermions, charge density waves. They have lots and lots of offers, and they take the cheapest offer, meaning the one that costs uh, the smallest amount of energy to and, and make it uh, the ground state. Now we would like to make the electrons an offer they cannot refuse. We would like to engineer them into being a non-abelian state. Uh, so let's see how we do that. The, the system we're going to discuss is a system of uh, uh, electrons at nu equals uh, 1 over m with spin up, and holes at nu equals minus 1 over m with spin down. So you know, m can be 1, in which case it's an integer quantum whole state, but more interesting is 3, 5, and so on. Um, the spin, I'm going to call this spin up and spin down. In fact, uh, it's not crucial that, that the electrons and the holes would have uh, opposite spins, uh, and we can think of it as a, as a layer index, basically. Now, in any case, since the filling factor here and here are opposite to one another, we're going to have edge states moving in opposite directions. One moving this way, the other one moving this way. One moving to the right, the other one moving to the left. Our proposal for having a non-abelian uh, defects in this system is going to be based on gapping those counter-propagating edge modes. And there are two ways to, to make this gapping, two mechanisms. 
One's going to be by backscattering, by letting electrons tunnel from one edge mode to the other. It must be full electrons. Quasi-particles cannot tunnel from one layer to the other. That, that's impossible. Uh, or alternatively, we will see that there can also be gapping by coupling to a superconductor. So, so let's go over those two one by one. If you have two edge modes, one moving this direction, the other one moving the opposite direction, and you allow electrons to tunnel from one to the other, you're going to get an energy gap. And, le le you know, we assume the chemical potential is here the causing point. So you're going to get a, a, an energy gap at the chemical potential. We, we saw that when we talked about uh, a wire construction of the quantum Hall effect. And in fact, it's a, a, the very basic notion of uh, nearly free electrons uh, uh, under periodic potential uh, forming an energy gap. So we have an energy gap, and that's an, that energy gap makes the system, if you put a chemical potential here, an insulator. Alternatively, you could couple the two edge modes to a superconductor, to a superconductor. And by, by that we mean you can allow the superconductor to extract one electron from this edge, one electron from this edge to form a Cooper pair. Or alternatively, of course, to give a Cooper pair to those two uh, edge modes, one to this, one to that. That will also introduce an energy gap. If the chemical potential here is at the causing, the, chemical the gap will be in the same place. But this energy gap will be a superconducting one because we couple the system to a superconductor. We introduce superconductivity into these two edge modes by proximity. Uh, now, we have those two mechanisms and we are going to make use of them. But before uh, showing how exactly, let's formalize the, the, the description a little bit. You remember how we, how we described the edge. For each of the two edges, we have a, a, an action. Or we have a Lagrangian density, which we discussed in the uh, first chapter of the course. The right moving edge will have a bosonic field chi r. The left moving edge will have a bosonic, uh, bosonic field chi l. Now, uh, the action for each of them will have a symplectic term and a, a, a potential interaction term. And the symplectic term um, is going to determine the commutation relation as it, as it happens between the field chi r and its uh, uh, derivative dx chi r, or the same with uh, uh, chi l. The commutation relation is going to encode the uh, particular quantum Hall state that we're talking about. It's going to encode the sigma xy of the quantum Hall state. Now, for the uh, present context, it makes uh, it's convenient to introduce two different fields that are the sum of the right and left movers and the difference of the right and left movers. And, and the reason why it's convenient is, is, is easily seen if you look at the commutation relations. Those two fields at least commute with one another. Well, commute, each one of them commutes with itself. So, so phi at different points commute, and, and theta at different point com points commute. Phi and theta do not commute with one another. And the commutation relation, again, encodes sigma xy, encodes the a particular quantum Hall state that we're uh, talking about. And I should say, this commutation relation is very non-local in space. Uh, so it's not that at the same point phi and theta do not commute to one another. Even at different points, they do not commute. And that's, again, a, a consequence of the uh, uh, special physics of the uh, fractional quantum Hall effect. Now, uh, those fields phi and, th and theta have uh, uh, physical meanings. Uh, the, x uh, the x derivative of uh, theta is the uh, charge density, the sum of the densities on the two layers, on the two edges of the two layers. And the uh, 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 x derivative of phi is the energy difference, uh, excuse me, the charge difference between the two uh, edges uh, or, or the spin density. Now we can, of course, construct just as we did uh, when we talked about a single edge, we can construct creation operator, operators for the electron on layer one, layer two, and for the Laughlin quasi-particle on layer one, la layer two. And those are going to look like e to the i m. Now, they used to look like e to the i m chi r or e to the i m chi l. Now we write them as e to the i m sum or difference of phi and theta. And if we look at the quasi-particle, the m disappear. It's only e to the i. 
uh, uh, phi uh, uh, plus or minus theta. Now, let's couple the, the two counterpropagating edges either to uh, one another by backscattering or to a superconductor. So a backscattering would look like psi dagger psi, a superconductor would look like psi psi plus psi dagger psi dagger. When we bosonize, uh, we're going to have a, one of them, the superconductor would be cosine 2m phi, and the backscattering one would be cosine 2m theta. If you look at, at, the, at the scheme that we want to, to carry out, you see it here. What we'd like is to have alternating regions of different couplings. We'd like to have half of the system uh, in an alternating way, half of the system gapped by a superconductor, half of the system gapped by backscattering. So, so we'd like to have, uh, in this case, three and three, uh, but we'd like to have a, a, a scheme where there will be also interfaces between a region that are coupled by superconductors and regions that are coupled by uh, backscattering. Why do we want that? Because at the interface, if we analyze the spectrum of this system, we find that at the interface, at any of these interfaces, and the interfaces here, 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 and so on, at these interfaces, there will be localized zero modes. What do I mean when I say localized zero modes? What I mean is there will be operators that uh, have support only very close to the interface and commute with the Hamiltonian. So if you operate such an operator on a ground state, it will take you to another ground state. So those operators are the indication of a ground state degeneracy and are the tools that we have to go from one ground state to another. Now, I won't get deep into the properties of those operators. I'll just say we call them parafermions. Now, the, the, the word parafermions is used in several contexts in slightly different meanings. Those are, those are parafermions which are extrinsic defects in our state. We, we introduced them by uh, engineering the Hamiltonian the way we, we did with these uh, uh, alternating couplings. Uh, but, but we can uh, understand the physics of those states by uh, focusing on a, on a, a superconducting uh, region, a superconducting segment. So let's say, uh, uh, you know, look at life from the point of view of the superconducting uh, segment. So uh, you see, on one side, the superconducting segment is, uh, uh, is facing a, a vacuum, an insulating vacuum. On the other side, it, uh, uh, and on the second and the third sides, it uh, faces insulating regions which were insulating by this backscattering uh, a gap that we introduced. And on the fourth side, it, uh, it faces a fractional quantum whole state, actually a couple of them, two layers, but fractional quantum whole states uh, which are incompressible, so charge cannot relax through them. So this superconducting region has uh, it, the, the only uh, um, entity with which it can exchange charge is the superconductor that gives it, that uh, induces superconductivity in the segment by proximity. But this big superconductor can accept charges only in units of two. So the charge on each of the superconducting segments is quantized modulo the charge of a group of pair. So it can take values, which we are going to, to list in a second, but modulo the charge of a group of pair. Now, what's the basic unit? What's the smallest charge, or what, what's the unit in which uh, the charge is quantized? It's the smallest unit of charge available in this system, which is 1 over m. It's the charge of the Laughlin quasi-particle. So each of these uh, uh, superconducting segments can have a charge that modulo 2e is either 0, 1 over m, 2 over m, tak, 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 2m minus 1 over m. All those possible values and the state of, the, of, uh, of this system can be described in terms of what is the fractional part of the charge on this one, on this one, on this one, on this one, and so on. Now, uh, uh, in principle, there could be different energies to each of those states. But no, they are not different, they are degenerate. 
And the uh, reason why they are degenerate is that look, you know, look at the at the, at the superconduct in this super, superconducting segment. You could imagine that there would be a charging energy that would separate between one e over m and two e over m. But that's not the case because the charge on the superconducting segment fluctuates by a huge number of Cooper pairs. The charge fluctuates by you know a billion Cooper pairs. So one third of a difference between one third and or one over m uh, difference between one over m and two over m, that's not going to matter. That's not going to change the total energy of the system. And therefore, we have a degeneracy of two m to the power of n minus one, where n is the number of superconducting segments. So you know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So uh, 2m to the power 6. And the reason for the power being n minus 1 is that the total charge must be an integer. So the last one is determined by all the others. Uh, so, so, so that's uh, the degeneracy. It's exponentially large in the uh, number of segments. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's protected. And the reason why it's protected is that we now understand that what determines the degeneracy is the, char the fractional part of the charge. And in order to measure that fractional part of the charge, you need to carry out a measurement on the entire segment. No local operation would tell you what's the charge on the, on, on the superconducting segment, and even less so, what's the fractional part of the charge. So the degeneracy is, is topological. Now, you know, the, the simplest case, of course, is m equals 1, in which case this is a new equals 1, and this is an integer quantum whole state, just a bilayer of integer quantum whole states. And uh, in that case, uh, the power fermion is just a Majorana operator, and the ground state degeneracy is the just 2 to the power of superconducting segments minus 1. And it's basically the story of topological superconductivity that we already uh, discussed. Uh, but the more interesting case in, uh, in, in this context is uh, M that's not 1, meaning uh, this region being a fractional quantum world state. Now, we have a set of uh, ground states which are degenerate. Uh, the degeneracy is topological. So we would like to uh, go on and carry out these topological manipulations. Uh, how are we going to do that? Well, we discussed that in two dimensions. In two dimensions, it's easy. You just interchange. Because you can, uh, you know, you see it on the figure. You, you can, uh, uh, the two quasi particles can move while staying far away from one another and just interchange positions. That's not going to be able to do in one dimension. If you do not let the, the defects go into the bulk, but they cannot go into the bulk because they, they come out of gapping edge modes. So what we are going to do is we are going to let them, to allow them to couple in exactly the same way uh, that you've all discussed in the topological superconductivity chapter. We're going to let this guy couple to this one, or this one couple to this one. To allow that to happen, we need to get them close to one another. So, you know, imagine that we apply gates that uh, push, push the wall here into the bulk and push this wall into the bulk in such a way uh, we create a quantum point contact that bring them close together uh, uh, to allow tunneling. Basically, think of these edges as a flexible ribbon. Um, if we do that, we can introduce tunneling uh, of quasi-particles from here to here, or from here to here, and so on. We don't want to allow tunneling to happen this way, because this would allow only tunneling of integer electrons, and we'd like to have tunneling of quasi-particles. Now, we need to carry out this uh, procedure of tunnel couplings between the different uh, zero modes in a way, and that's a crucial point, in a way that keeps the degeneracy of the ground state fixed. We do not want to change, while we do all this manipulation, the ground state degeneracy. Because if we do that, there will be a new energy scale appearing, which is the splitting, the, the splitting of the degeneracy, and it will uh, enter into the Top, uh, the unitary transformation that we carry out, make it non-topological. If we do the entire process without changing the ground state degeneracy, and I'm not going into the details, uh, Yuval went into the details for the Majorana case, uh, but if we 
uh, do that, the unitary transformation is topological and is given by the non-abelian Berry phase, which is the time order product of an exponent uh, of i times the integral along a trajectory in parameter space of a, 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 the Berry vector potential a, a psi i a scalar product with the gradient of psi j, where psi i and psi j are different ground states. Um, so we can do that. I won't get into the details, but I'll tell you what the unitary transformation that result. Uh, what is the unitary transformation that result? Uh, and, and as you can more or less imagine, uh, the simplest uh, unitary transformations will be when you interchange these two or these two, na namely neighboring zero modes, which are uh, 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 at the ends of the same segment. Uh, so if, if you interchange these two guys, uh, the unitary transformation is e to the i, i pi m over 2 times the charge on the superconducting segment squared. And if you interchange the, the, uh, uh, those two guys, instead of the charge, since you are now going across a region, an insulating region, it would be the spin squared. Uh, and those two don't commute. And this is the non-abelian aspect, the non-abelian nature of the unitary transformations that we carry out. Here it is, by, uh, by this S is not commuting with the Qs. So we now have a set of operations which are uh, topologically protected and which uh, do not commute with one another and form a set of possible uh, unitary transformation that we can carry out. Now I should say can carry out is it's, it's very challenging. The, uh, at least we're talking about Gedanken experiments. Here the, the experimental uh, realization is a very, very challenging process. But that's not the, the point I want to uh, discuss at the moment. What I want to say is this state of unit transform unitary transformations, as exciting as they are, topologically protected in a, a non-abelian uh, way and so on and so forth, unfortunately do not form a, a set of operations that uh, is universal for a, topo for a quantum computer. So uh, um, that realization gives us a lot of uh, possibilities, but is not enough for universal topological quantum computer. In order to make it topological, you need to go further in a direction which I will not describe here, but uh, 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 put a reference in the notes. What I want to do in the remaining time is uh, examine a different aspect of, uh, you know, these power fermions. And this is, can they live in one dimension? So, you know, in general, we know that anions live in two dimensions. Um, and in particular, they don't live in one dimension. Can we try and cheat? Can we try and, you know, make them live in one dimension without them noticing that? Um, or are we going to lose the entire power fermion story? Or maybe we're going to lose a little a part of it and keep part of it? Let's see. So how are we going to do that? We're going to take the, the, the disk that we had before and put a hole inside it. So, so you see, we now have a hole here and, uh, uh, and two, two edges, each one of the edges uh, being uh, uh, gapped in an alternating way between superconducting regions, uh, backscattering regions, superconducting regions, backscattering regions, and so on and so forth. So each one of these edges had the, the two counter-propagating edge, edge modes that we had before, uh, gapped here by a superconductor, here by an insulator, by backscattering, and, and, and so on. And now what we're going to do, let's focus on, on a, a small part of this annulus that we had before. Let's look at, the, uh, at this small part. What we'd like to do is we'd like to thin it down, yeah, but, but, but keep the interface modes here, 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 and here very far away from one another. So we're going to thin this down, making it one-dimensional, but n without allowing any tunneling between the zero modes. So could it be that the zero modes will survive the transition to one dimension and we will have this uh, power fermionic ground state degeneracy in one dimension, despite the fact that we know that anions live only in two dimensions? Could that work? 
That's what I, uh, I'd like to discuss now. And let me tell you the answer. The answer is, for my one modes, it works. They can live in one dimension. For power fermionic modes, it's not going to work. So what's going to happen is that the power fermions will reduce to becoming Majorana uh, uh, modes uh, only. Uh, and let's see how that happens. So first of all, you know, we're thinning this down, keeping the two, uh, or, or the, keeping the interface modes away from one another, but letting the, the uh, domains, the superconducting segments, get close to one another. Now, the degeneracy of the ground state, as we know, as long as the system has no coupling between the edges, the degeneracy is 2m to the number of superconducting regions minus 1. We don't know how, how many superconducting regions there are here because we see only a small slice of the entire annulus. But anyway, uh, uh, that's the, 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 the degeneracy. Now, the ground states are characterized by the charges on each superconducting segment, taking a, a value uh, that's uh, defined modulo 2 in units of 1 over m. Now, what's going to happen when we uh, uh, thin down the, 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 the strip? Quasi-particles cannot tunnel from here to here. Nothing can tunnel from here to here because the distance is very large. Quasi-particles also cannot tunnel from here to here. And this is because the operator for a quasi-particle is, as we saw before, is e to the i phi plus or minus theta. And in this region, in these regions, be them superconducting or insulating, only one of these two um, fields condenses to a well-defined value. Now, so, so that's why a quasi-particle cannot tunnel. Also, a single electron, by the way, cannot tunnel into a superconductor. But two quasi-particles, which would form a, a combination of e to the 2, 2i two phi, or e to the 2i theta, those combinations can tunnel into a region in which either phi or theta uh, condenses. So two quasi-particles can tunnel from one region here to one region here. For example, from a superconductor to a superconductor. And because of that, what's going to happen is that if we are uh, specialized to the case of m equal 3, and we have six possible values of the charge, 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, 1, 4 thirds, and 5 thirds, 5 thirds what happens is that this 0, 2 thirds, and 4 thirds will be coupled by this type of Pairs, tan pair of quasi-particles tunneling from one superconductor to another, uh, they will couple and the superposition will form one ground state, a superposition of all these three, and the other three, one-third, one, and five-thirds, will couple to one another to form a second ground state in such a way that instead of having six degenerate ground states, we now have only two. We reduce the degeneracy from a power fermion degeneracy to a Majorana de degeneracy. And this is because even though the, zero mo the interface modes are very far away from one another, there are operators of tunneling that uh, can perform tunneling between domains, not between zero modes. So as we thin down to one dimension, uh, power fermions become uh, Majorana zero modes. That's basically the story I wanted to say, uh, to, to tell you today. Uh, and to sum, uh, to sum it up, we said that um, by coupling edges of fractional quantum Hall states uh, to one another and to superconductors, we can generate extrinsic zero modes of power fermionic nature with a ground state degeneracy and with topological uh, manipulations associated with inter interchanges. But these power fermions do not survive a transition to one dimension. They belong to the two-dimensional realization we introduced in the beginning.